Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Uh, actually, I have one of the chips in my office for some reason. Um, they took me on a boat on Hawaii, uh, and they're like, here's a, here's a burnt out chip from Spark that has you know Oracle compression built inside of it. I'm like, okay, I have it. I don't know what to do with it. Um, all right, anyway, sorry. Enough. <laughs> we, we can go forever. All right, um, databases, query optimization. All right, so last class, we didn't get through everything. Uh, we'll, we'll go over this again. Again, I'll, I'll go I mean, a bit slower than maybe I did last time. Uh, just walk through what Cascades is doing, and then we'll finish up with randomized search before we jump into what today's paper is about. But again, the, 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 the things we discussed last class was going through this progression of how to do uh, more sophisticated things with the query optimizer, starting from just if and else rules, looking for patterns that then do some kind of rewrites, um, which, is every, which everyone uses when they first start out. And then we saw how uh, System R in the 1970s introduced this cost-based join search, and that's sort of the backbone of uh, how the stratified search and unified search uh, came along. And then randomized search will be will just it's a variation of this. So the, the distinction we, we were talking about last time was, again, the stratified search and the unified search. And as I was saying, the lines are kind of blurry. We're like, OK, cascades in SQL Server is technically a unified search. But the way they invoke some of the rules, uh, the transformation rules, as we'll see in a second, it's basically doing it without a cost-based search. Like they're doing transformations that you always want to do uh, first, and then they do something that is more exploratory search, as you would see in Cascades. And so the thing that maybe matters the most is that the the we want to be able to define the transformation rules ideally in the same dialect or DSL, whatever you want to call it, that allow us to then be able to decide: oh, Do I want to move stuff to be always in this front phase that I always want to run, or the, or the second phase where I do, do more exploration stuff? Right, so the stratified search is having two separate phases, one with just heuristics, or sorry, one using the rules, but without a cost model, the second one is doing cost-based search. And then the unified search is the idea is like you just do everything all at once. And to avoid a bunch of expensive uh, transformations or getting stuck in infinite loops, we saw again how the memo table is going to help with that. So less so about maybe the stratified search versus unified search. The thing that really matters that when we be understand is the distinction between top-down versus bottom-up. Right? So the cascades approach is top down, meaning I start with the outcome that I want. Like this is the final output I want for my query. I don't know how I got there in my query plan, but I'm going to go down uh, the tree and assemble the pieces, or assemble the operators I need to then feed me into uh, you know, to my final output. Whereas in the bottom optimization, which is what, what the system R guys started with, is that you start with nothing and you, you then add the, the operators you need to get you up to the goal that you want. And again, me standing up here and making hand gestures like this and this maybe doesn't really sink in and mean anything, but there are certain optimizations you can apply more easily in one versus another. At a high level, they are uh, composable, they're, they're, they're commutative, that you could use one versus another. But there are some optimizations you can do in the top down one that maybe you can't do in bottom up, and likewise in bottom up you can't do in top down. Yes? Is stratified always bottom up? Or? No, his question is, is stratified always bottom up? This is what I'm saying, like, the, is, is cascades as, as described by Microsoft? Is that stratified? Because they have a bunch of rules that you always run. Then later on, they run the cost-based search. And in that cost-based search, it's doing uh, top-down. But the, the transformation rules are sort of, sort of operating in sort of the same way. They're generating these like, logical plans in a top-down manner, too. But that, that would be technically, that, that's a stratified search, because you have something you always do, and then you have a cost-based thing that you can be dynamic about. Right. right. So most of the open source systems are going to be bottoms up. Uh, even the guy that invented Cascades said the way to uh, the way you probably want to do uh, query optimization now is start with Cascades in a sort of the stratified manner, like run some initial the rules. Maybe not necessarily in the full cost-based search. It, it wasn't clear. It's this sort of offhand comment he made at a conference. And then you want to do the the bottoms up, up or sorry, the bottom up join bottoms up optimization to pick join ordering. All right, so. Again, today's class, I just want to spend the, sort of the first half just going over again what we missed and rushed through at the end of last class of the unified search and cascades. And then we'll see how we then apply the randomized search. And then I want to go quickly over some, some real world examples of uh, what, the, what some closed source and open source query optimizers actually, actually look like. Um, the main ones, it's going to be SQL Server, CalSite, Orca, and uh, CalcusDB. 
And then we'll finish up with going over at a high level, the, again, the, the unnesting subquery paper you guys are signed to reading. Um, hopefully, that wasn't too, too dense on the relational algebra, but it, it's, a, it's one of the things where I think everyone should know it. Uh, we probably should teach it in the intro class. Um, very few systems actually implement it entirely. As far as I know, only DuckDB, Umbra, and Hyper. Uh, my former student who took 721, she's at Databricks. She implemented I think, almost all of it in Databricks, and, uh, but not, not, not everything. Um, but we'll, we'll walk through an example there. And then, unfortunately, for the sake of time, we're not going to be able to cover the, how Hyper does their, their, um, their dynamic, dynamic programming approach or DP approach for uh, finding join orders. But we can cover that offline if you want separately. All right, so again, this is just to repeat what we talked about in the last class. Um, where the, the Cascades optimizer is, is going to be the, the third version or third generation of a query optimizer this guy, Gertz Graffy, built. Exodus came first, then Volcano, and it's the same Volcano when we described the Volcano model, this iterator thing. But in that, in that system or in that, those papers, he also describes how to do parallel queries with the exchange operator. And then he has this optimizer generator uh, that, that he built in Volcano. And then after that, he then built Cascades. Um, but as far as I know, he just wrote the paper on Cascades. It's very heavy-handed on object-oriented programming because that was the hot thing in late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then as far as I know, nobody, he didn't actually implement it except for being involved in this master's thesis a few years later at Portland State. But then Microsoft hired him to go build their new query optimizer because they were rewriting everything from their fork of Sybase. Uh, and that's why, uh, again, Microsoft famously is using, um, using Cascades. So it's going to be a top-down approach using a branch balance search. Um, and the, the sort of the key idea uh, of what makes Cascades interesting and better than what came before was that the, they were doing the uh, incremental materialization of the possible, uh, of the possible ways to, to, to represent some expression, which I'll say, say this in a second, but some, some operator in the query plan. Whereas in like Volcano, when you search down and you land at some node in the tree, you immediately materialized everything, which would explode your search base. Even though you may, not, you may, not, may, run, may run out of time to examine everything at that operator at that level of the tree, you still materialize everything. And so your, your, uh, the memory cost of, of, of Volcano would, would explode. So the, the, the four key ideas of Cascades, as we talked about last class, Again, everything is going to be represented as, as data structures. So within a task, we'd have, here's the pattern I'm looking for in my query plan. Here's the transformation I, I, I want to apply. And you can have additional things like a priority that says this thing should be, should be considered more quickly than, or sooner than, than, than another one. And in, in the paper, you can actually modify these, these priorities on the fly. Uh, but in practice, again, I don't, Cockroach GB does it, Microsoft does not. Then you have explicit definition of these, what properties we need to, our operators to have to ensure that if data needs to be sorted a certain way or data needs to come uh, you know, com in a certain compressed form, we can make sure that anything we, any operator we would generate in our query plan uh, at some level in the tree uh, meets the expectations of, sorry, anything below us in the tree meets the expectation of the parent we're, we're, we're feeding into. And then we talked about this, and you, you, can, you can reorder things on the fly to find the, the best plan more quickly based on what you know the query plan has done so far. And then this last one, again, is important that within the same search engine and the rule definitions, we can uh, do pattern matching and transformations of expressions in where clauses, having clauses, or join clauses, whatever, in the same way that we would do uh, uh, search for you know, converting logical operators to physical operators. And this is nice, again, it, you don't have to do like, one pass for the where clause to optimize that, and then a separate pass for the, the, the query plans themselves, all that's done in a, in a single engine. Like I think MySQL, they, they treat the expressions and the where clauses separately from the, the query operators. So they have sort of two, two optimization passes. All right, so the things we, the definitions we care about in Cascades is this notion of an expression. And it's just gonna be some operation that we wanna do in, in, in our query plan that is gonna have zero or more inputs coming, coming into us. So it could be a leaf in, in, the, in the query plan, or it could be some, some middle operator, right? And we can sort of group them together and say, here's a, here's a higher level thing that we want to do, and we'll represent that as an expression. So for example, if I want to join A, B, and C on simple IDs, I could have a logical expression that says, I'm going to join A with B, then join that with C. And then if I flip the order, then that's considered a, another expression as well. 
And then I can have a physical, uh, physical uh, manifestation of that expression by actually specifying, here's the scan method I'm going to use, or access method I'm going to use for that given table, and here's the join algorithm I, I want to use. And then now I'm going to combine or, or group these together, the, the equivalent expressions based on what we know as the relational algebra rules, into what is called a group. And the idea is here is that within one container or construct uh, or entry in, in, in our system, in our query optimizer, we would say, here's the output I, that I expect, you know, uh, A, A join B join C. And then here's all the equivalent logical expressions, uh, you know, permutations of the join order. And then here's all the equivalent physical expressions. So within one entry in, in our system, we could say, here's everything that, here's all the different possible ways we could actually execute and produce the output we would need uh, for, for a single group. So the entire thing itself is the group, and then these are all just the equivalent expressions. And then also embed additional information about like here's the properties that I need to have com coming into the data that I want here. So then we can combine expressions even further into what's called a, a multi-expression. And this is just basically a, a placeholder that says there's some expression below me in, in, in the query plan, and at this point, at this group in, in, my, in my search tree, I don't actually know what it, what it is, right? But I'm just gonna keep track of like, I know something below me can tell me how this thing would actually be executed. So for example, if I need to join A, B, and C, I could have a, a, a multi-expression that says, I'm gonna join A and B, I don't know how, and I don't know in what order, but then I'm, I'm gonna join whatever the output of that is with C. And then you have the various combinations of, of the, the join orders and so forth. And likewise, the various combinations for the, uh, for what algorithm we're going to use to, to join it, right? So if it's, if it's a bottoms-up approach, you're basically starting with like the smallest atomic multi-expression you could have, like go read A, right? And then you go add the pieces or you know, the components to that going up towards to the optimizer, to, to, to the final output. In this case, because we're at the top, going top down, we, you know, we start with this multi-expression that says, I'm, I want some output of A join B join C, and then I'm going down and then filling in, filling in the, the, the you know, specifications or the, the exact details of how to do that. Again, this is, the, this is how they're going to get away with not having to materialize everything all at once when you land, say, in a, in a group as you search down the tree. Because now you say, I have a placeholder for A and B. Something, something, someone below me is going to tell me how to handle that. But right now, I can just reason about whatever expressions I'm looking at uh, within my group directly. And then likewise, you can make further decisions based on those priorities, as we talked about. Like, if I'm, if I'm trying to consider, should I go look at what, a, what happens when I join A and B? Should I go look at what happens when I scan C? Uh, you, know, you can decide dynamically as you're, you know, as you're going down the tree which of these paths you want, you want to look at first. So this we've already defined. Again, the rules are just ways to convert logical operators to logical operators or, or logical to physical. Um, and in, in the end, the database system needs physical operators because that tells you, you know, what the system is actually going to do when it, when it executes things, right? And then within a rule, we'd say, here's the pattern that I, that I want to uh, match on, uh, either, either in a logical expression or a physical expression, and then here's the transformation I want to do to put the query plan that I'm looking at or the group that I'm looking at into a, a new form. So this is the example we saw before. I have a, my pattern is to identify when I have two joins uh, across three groups. And then uh, I would have a, say, a logical plan that looks like this. And note here, again, I have the multi-expression that says I'm joining A and B. But then down below me, now I'm specifying A, a you know, join A with B. And then below that, I can specify how I'm actually accessing the data. So I'm going to have a, a transformation rule that says just rotate it left to right. Or I could have an implementation rule that says, convert all the equi joins that I have in here into a cert merge join or hash join or an essay loop join and so forth, right? And as we said before, to avoid having to get stuck in infinite loops, because I could go like left to right and right to left and just doing these transformations over and again, we could use the memo table to keep track of have I, do I know something about what the outcome of this transformation will be and therefore I don't need to apply it because I've already seen it. So rather than doing that on like, on every individual rule for every single possible state of the query plan, my memo table is just going to keep track of like, okay, I know that uh, for this multi-expression, I have a cost for it, uh, and I don't need to, you know, I don't need to go look at what happens when I make that transformation if I 
if that transformation's cost is going to be, uh, sorry, if the, uh, the cost of the query plan after that transformation is worse than the best I've seen, then I, then I know I don't, don't need to go look at it. So as we said, the memo table, again, the different ways to implement this, I think uh, Microsoft puts this as uh, actually inside the groups themselves. Um, I think CockroachDB maintains this as a separate hash table. But it's basically, again, some, some table that's going to keep track of for a given, uh, given multi-expression. Here's the best, uh, the, the best physical operator I've seen for it, and here's, the best, uh, the, and here, here's its lowest cost. You also keep track of like, the, the properties that I care about, whether the data is coming up with this operator uh, for a given multi-expression with, what, again, what physical properties. And I can know that if I'm looking at something differently, even though uh, like I'm looking at, 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 a, at a different multi, if I'm looking at a different operator like I, in, below me in the group, if it has a different physical property, I can then maybe still evaluate and go, go further. And you would do these things like, if the best cost I've seen so far is a sequential scan, but I know that for the given group that I'm at, I really want data to be sorted now because that'll change my, my cost expectations. Then if the, the, the multi-group below me doesn't now, you know, does not enforce that property or provide that property, I can still go down and look, at, look for other things. So the, the basic idea how this is going to work, uh, not to get too theoretical, is this, this idea of the principle of optimality. And all it says is that if we have a, what is the true optimal plan, then any subplan of that optimal plan is going to be optimal, right? It's sort of a tautology. It's sort of like you know self-defining. Like if I have the optimal plan, then any portion of that of that query plan is going to be optimal because if it wasn't optimal, then that wouldn't be the optimal plan. So because of that, this is how we're going to be able to do branch and bound search to identify that if the if I'm at some some level in in my search tree, if the cost to traverse down to my query plan as I go below is now worse than the best plan I've ever seen so far, then I know I don't need to go down and look further because there's no magic way that that cost is now going to go become less. Because you know, as you go down the level, you're adding more physical operators, you're accumulating more cost estimates, right? and that's just a summation. So you're not magically going to get faster. So we can just cut things off and avoid having to search, search further. All right, so this is the example that we had before. Uh, again, we, we want to join A, B, and C. So at the very beginning, we just start with, at the root, and we apply logical tra uh, transformations to, to generate different logical multi-expressions. And then, say, for, for, rather than materializing a bunch of all the logical multi-expressions, we'll just jump down to the first one we have and see what the cost is. So now we come down here, do the same thing. We have the multi-expression A, B. We do a logical uh, transformation to, to convert it into a multi-expression on A joined by a multi-expression on B. But now we need to get the cost of these, these, these inner multi-expressions. So we go down here, and this is doing the access on A. There's nothing other than just get A. There's, not, there's not, no other multi, uh, logical multi-expression. So then we'll materialize the different physical multi-expressions, so either sequential scan on A or index scan on A. For brevity, I'm not showing you, like, okay, what index I'm actually using, but you can imagine, you know, for all my possible choices of indexes, uh, you, you would have additional, you, you would have uh, you know, multiple, or for each index I could use, an index scan on a table, I would have an entry for each of those. And then you, again, you can do ranking uh, in the priority list and say, well, only consider the, the indexes that, uh, you know, rank them, rank the order in which I value the indexes in, in my, in my multi-expression list here based on the, the selectivity of them or the, uh, which ones cover the most columns that I need in my query. There's a bunch of different rules you can do to figure out instead of just blindly looking at all possible uh, indexes. All right, so now that we have these, these two different uh, physical multi-expressions, we, we do some cost model lookup and say, OK, well, the sequential scan is going to be the fastest. It has the cost of 10. So we add the multi-expression on A into our, our memo table and with the best physical expression we, we've gotten for it with the cost of 10. Then we go back up the tree, do the same thing down on B, same thing. We convert that to physical multi-expressions. We end up with sequential scan and next scan on B. Sequential scan is still faster. We get, we get a cost of 20. And then now we bounce, up, bounce back up to our, uh, to our, our multi-expression on AB. We do further uh, transformations to, to now flip the order of, of the joints. Now B is joining A. But now we need, again, to do the same thing and get the, what is the cost of actually accessing these different uh, tables. Well, if when, we, when we go down to, uh, 
to these lower nodes here, we will see that we've already done this costing for us because it's in our memo, ta memo table. So we actually don't even do the do traversal. We can, at this point here, we can just go look up the memo table and say, what is the best cost for, for you know, scanning B and scanning A? And then we, we just reuse that. So now again, say you know, there's only A join B and B join A. So now we generate all the physical um, uh, multi-expressions. And then again, using our cost model, we then figure out that the hash join is the fastest. So the cost of the hash join plus the cost of the scans on A and B produces the cost of 80, and that goes in our memo table. And then we bounce back up, and do, now go to the other side of C, and do the same evaluation, yada, yada, and so forth, until we then you know, maybe exhaust the search for uh, the different join orders we have for A, B, and C, and we um, end up with uh, the lowest cost of 125. So this is clear. So this is what Cascades is doing. Again, you're, you're starting with, in this case here, I'm going to join A, B, and C. Not specifying the order, not specifying how I'm actually accessing the, the, the tables, not specifying what the, what the join algorithm I'm going to use. And I traverse down and use the memo table to keep track of the best cost I have. Yes? So this is entirely cost-based, but you said there were a few rules that tries to apply every single time. Yes. So how would that uh, work? So would it first build this table and then, or would it do it somehow before? So like, like the, like what I showed here, like, okay, I have get A, yeah. and then I take the logical exp multi-expression and convert it to physical multi-expression. Like, the rule could be, like, you would say, if I, if I land here, I know I'm accessing a logical expression on a scan on its, on a, or accessing a table. So let me always run the transformation rule, implementation rule, that spits out different physical multi-expressions. Right, so the rule would simply just say, always pick sequential scan for A. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that you always generate the multi-expressions that are sequential scan and all possible index scans on A. That's that true. always gets fired. Okay. Then you do a cost-based search to say, or you know, selection, which one of these is the best. Now, whether or not you materialize all possible physical multi-expressions depends on the complexity of whatever it is that you're doing, because that might balloon up and be huge, like up, you know, the joiner up above. Right. So you could have a ranking, say, like, uh, to like previously, I think I should look at these join orders first. Okay. Yes. Sorry, what was the difference between this and Volcano? Volcano was exhausted. Yeah, the question is, what's the, what's the difference between this and Volcano? Uh, the, the difference is that when you landed, say, at the, at the very, very beginning, so back up here, I generate all the logical multi-expressions and all the, 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 the physical multi-expressions. And again, it seems kind of obvious that you wouldn't want to do that, but I don't know, was it 80s, 90s, right? Um, they, I don't, Volcano didn't have priorities. Volcano also didn't have, um, uh, I, I don't think you could evaluate the, the where clause expressions in the same method as well. Right. Question, yes. So in the late, later slides, well, not two slides later, in the topmost table, you, when you populate the physical expressions, you still have groups like A, B, C. Like these are, these are logical groups, right? These are not actual. Uh, you mean like like this right here? Yes. Right. Like so. What's the question? Is this this is not like a physical? Um, up, there's no physical upper. It's, it's saying like A and B need to be joined together, right? Is that what that's presenting? Yeah. So right here, it's saying I, I want to join A and C together, but it, here you're not defining how to do it. Right. You then go look up the memo table and say what's the best way for me to, to have done that. Okay. Yeah. Why do we say we're applying those rules? Uh, before, if you're doing it while we're doing all the cost estimation. So this is still entirely unified, right? Like there isn't a set of things that you're doing before. You're doing this entire thing all together, where you're applying these transformations, also estimating the cost, picking the best one, and then going back up. So yeah, so his question is like. It's not two stages. Yeah, why, how can I say that you could use Cascades to do a two stage approach? Yeah. So like think of like the, when you first show up, you convert the AST from the parse SQL query into uh, some, you know, you, you would have like a group like this. I know, I know I'm going to access A. So you at least start populating those things, right? And then without, I don't know how Microsoft actually does that, whether they can, you know, inject themselves in any point in the tree and start doing transformations, or they always start at the top and go down. But there's like, you could say you could say I'm gonna traverse the tree and only apply these rules to put me into a form that when I do a cost-based search, I'm kind of pushed in the direction where I know is going to be a better you know a better plan. 
And the second was building on top of Connor's question, which was, uh, you said in Volcano it won't do everything exhaustive, but in the, in the diagram you made like four different knowledge base I, I put dot, 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 yeah. right? Like whether, so, it's PowerPoint. Like whether or not it, it looks at all of them. It is exhaustive though. No. No, it's not. No, because you, so again, we, we talked about the, when, the termination rules. It could be a timer. It could be like how many transformations I've done. It could be like I haven't seen anything better. Volcano did not have that. Uh, I mean, they all had some kind of timer. But it's, again, it's whether or not you, you, you would, again, materialize all possible things ahead of time before you even look at them, Volcano did not do that. Uh, There's other like object-oriented programming stuff, which, again, is just, we don't care about. I was going to ask, like, what data is like, on limits to make these estimations with? Like, for example, like, um, like when like, you have like, page information, like, some, like the aggregate information for a page, it allows you to know if you're going like, to skip it or not. Like for the cost? Yeah, for determining like That's next week, right? That comes later. But like you would, in a traditional database system, like meaning like you have, you know, statistics you've collected by running Analyze or whatever, like you would, you would, you would, the cost model would tell you what the selectivity of, of you know, a low level operator like this would be. Like how many data, how much data I think I'm going to read, you know, if it's just a straight sequential scan versus like an index scan. But this is all data that you have to have collected in What do you mean touch the data? Because like, it's like a difference between like running, like there's only certain things you know after you run the, the query, obviously. Yes. Um, but like this analytics comes from either previous runs or estimations made. Correct. The statement is th like these cost of estimates, as I'm describing here, are done mating, make, using summarizations or sketches or whatever you will call it of the data that you've either derived from previous runs or your own, own analysis. I would also throw a third category, and you'll see on Monday next week, is sometimes there's just a sample of data that's local, and you could run, like, you know, a, you know run the where clause on that, on that sample data just to see what the estimate's going to be, right? SQL Server does that. Um, but, like, all that is, is it abstracted away from, from this part is through the cost model. Yes? Why might one want to prefer to do the to join ordering bottom-up? This question, why, why do you want to do bottom-up versus top-down? Yeah, yeah so, so good question. So there's some weird things like you may not be able to do, the, do all the branch bounding stuff that we want to do because I got to get to the bottom first. Meaning like I can't say, okay, well, I, I'm at this point here and I know that um, maybe, maybe I'm farther up in the tree. Like think of like doing a lot of joins. Like, so I'm up here and I have, I can't do any pruning of the, of the search tree below me until something gets to the bottom and produces what I think is the best possible plan. So you always have to generate the full plan, then you can start pruning other things. And then sometimes like you can't, you do have to do the materialization of the logical to physical because I don't know, I can't do cost estimates, or I can't get the, the can't get the lower bound if it's, if it's just a logical expression. I gotta convert it to the, a physical operator to know what the true cost is gonna be. There's some tricks you can play around with, like, like doing estimates of like, you know, worst case scenario things. Um, but it's in the, if you're going bottom to the top, like along each step, I have a physical operator and I can, I can cost things right there. Uh, we materialize what, sorry? Materialize physical operators as you go instead of uh, converting them. There's other optimizations you can do, which we don't have time to cover, from like the hyper guys of like grouping things together in hypergraphs and like just costing those things separately from other pieces, where this just looks at everything all at once. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I can, it's, it's like 2006 paper. It, it's in the reading list. I just don't, I, I might mention I don't have time to cover it, but like they show that like they, in practice, they find the, they find the optimal join algorithm faster than, or join ordering faster than cascades. You know, Microsoft has put a ton of effort and money into it. Yes? How does the data product become into play in this scenario? Like, is it Twitter uh, related and it's sorted? Yeah, so the question is, how, how does like, the, the, the data properties come, in, come to play in any of this? Would be like, say that, uh, say that I, I picked here 
uh, I'm going to do a merge join. So not, so not a sort merge join, a merge join. So I assume that my inputs have to be sorted. So as I traverse down, uh, then I could say, don't give me anything that, that's not sorted. Right? And then I could record that actually in, the, in my memo table to say, OK, for the scan on B, here's the, the lowest cost with, when it's with, with these set of properties, and here's the lowest cost with this other set of properties. So then I can decide, OK, if, my, if I need those properties, I can check the memo table to see whether that, cost, whether that operator is providing it for me. So, so information is also embedded in the memory uh, Yeah, the, the memo table, I'm not showing here because it's PowerPoint, but like, you would keep track of like, what properties you know, a given multi-expression and, a, and a, the best expression for it provides. And then you can decide whether that's going to give you what you need or not. That's right. What are some other types of properties other than sorting? Sorting is the most common one. Uh, you could say, like, compression. Um, I'm not showing, like, we're not showing projections, obviously, here. But, like, I, I, I need these columns, stuff like that. And then that can change based on one like, like, it's like a column store or a row store. Because row store could always shove it up, but a column store if it's like disaggregated across different nodes, it becomes more complicated. The reason I ask is because like, would you have to store every single set of like subset of properties for every single combination of tables? The question is, would you have to store for every? So, if you just think of like sorting, in this obvious one to deal with, right? Is this one, that's one or zero? But if you had like five, no, 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 no. But like, it'd be sorting me like sort of on what column? Oh yeah, like that as well. Yeah, so you have you have to keep track of like I'm accessing this this data and it's coming into me, it's going to be sorted in this column. Or I, I can then do a transformation to say, all right, well, I'm looking at a, you know, a merge join here. Therefore, I need my data sorted. So you would then have a transformation where you can then say, OK, populate the thing below me to make sure I'm looking at things being sorted or not. Or you can pass hints down and say, OK, I, at this point here, maybe I don't, I don't want things sorted. Oh. So don't, don't consider it. So is this memo table generated at the beginning of everything, or is it like are there, um, let's say, maybe combinations of tables that we may want to exclude from the memo table at the very beginning? The question is, are there combinations of tables we may want to exclude from the memo table in the beginning? Um, like, for example, like if, if I want to sort on, like if I have a table with like five columns, I only want to sort on one column. Yeah, so Microsoft does this. Microsoft will pre-populate the memo table in this first stage and then sort of seed it with things that it, that it knows it should, should probably consider first. And then that way, when you do this search, you, you, you may prefer things that I, that I already know about. Yeah. Yes? Uh, building on his question, uh, can I say that we, all, we need to do bottom if you want to do adaptivity? I know we're not there. It's probably next week's topic. But like, if you want to do adaptivity, you definitely need to do bottom up. His question is, if you want to do adaptivity, uh, you have to do bottom up adaptivity when? Uh, like while the query is running? Yeah. Why? Why would you have to do, do it? Why do we have to go bottoms up? Because if you're bottoms up, you start with like a sequential scan, and then you can, uh, or like you, you want to switch to an index scan. That's your adaptivity aspect of it, right? In mm -hmm. that case, if you're doing it bottom up, won't it be slightly more easy to control what's happening as opposed to having to go uh, explore all the way from the top? Uh, his statement is: if you want to be ad adaptive, it would be easier to do bottoms up versus tops down. Um, Well, let's punt this the next week to see how they do it. The, the gist of the way you do it, one of the approaches we'll see for the do adaptive query execution is you just inject a new physical operator. Oh, see, that's bad, right? We probably don't want to do that. But we, we, Wait, why is that bad? Because if, you, if you're injecting it, you're continuously adding more costs, right? If you're adding, injecting another operator in the middle of this, yes. you're adding cost to what, what, what goes above, right? To the total. Uh, the physical operator is like a, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use the word sentinel. It's basically a, 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 a gate that checks, is the data coming out what I expect it to look like? And then if not, you then make a decision. It's like a trigger in the query plan. It has no, like, it has no substantial cost to the query plan because it literally is like, is my selectivity what I think it's going to be, what, what I thought it was? Yeah, that's next class. Okay. That's Monday. Yes, he's jumping ahead. But to, to your point, like it depends on the implementation. Like you could, um, 
like whether or not you inject the activity pieces while you're doing this, like generating the query plan, or like you just say, I got my physical plan, you embed now in the operators your cost estimates, you know, cardinality estimates, and then you say, okay, well, here's, you know, here's my leaf node scan. I'll now inject that, that trigger check uh, right above it. And if I see that the data is coming out, doesn't match what, what was in my scan below me, then I'll do something else. But you, you don't need to do that potentially for the cost based search. You can imagine a scenario where you say, um, uh, you could include in your cost estimates to say, this is going to be more expensive to do, but I'll add this trigger check to make sure that like, I don't, this could be really expensive. This could be really expensive to do, if I um, if I get it wrong. So let me add my trigger check to make sure I, 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 that I don't get it wrong, uh, and then choose the thing that's more expensive. So you can like do play games like that. Let, let's let's punnel that till next week. Most of the systems that do adaptivity will be simple uh, push downs of certain operations. So Snowflake, Snowflake will push down an, uh, an aggregation. To a remote node above, you know, b above a join or something like that. If it's if it sees certain things, other other triggers would be like, "Ah, right, this is way this query plan is just terrible. Stop, throw everything away, and go back to query optimizer." And then the other ones can be more more clever about like switching plans on the fly. But nobody does that in practice, as far as I know. They'll do like simple movements now. Okay, other question. <coughs> so uh, there's a bunch of implementations of cascades. Uh, again. Cascades is the name of the paper. As far as I know, there was no implementation of it. Like Volcano, as far as I know, there was a system and code base called Volcano that people were using. Um, the actual implementations that were out there in the early 90s was this thing called uh, Op++ out of Wisconsin. I think Jignesh's office mate worked on this um, when he was in Wisconsin, because he did his PhD there. Uh, and then uh, Portland State was again with the Columbia, pro Columbia system. Again, that was... Uh, Gertz Graffy was involved in that. Gertz Graffy's PhD advisor was also Jignesh's PhD advisor, like this guy Dave DeWitt, who invented a lot of early parallel distributed databases stuff. Um, uh, Greenplum built this thing called Orca, which we'll cover in a second. That actually, you know, that's sort of like CalSite, where it's like a standalone optimizer as a service, similar to what we're trying to do for OpD. And then here's a bunch of the other ones that, that are implemented uh, in actual full systems. So we'll, let's come back to Cascades. Uh, other implementations. Let me go. Actually, hold up. Yeah, let me do more cascades before we go to um, randomized algorithms. All right. So SQL Server. So the cascades paper is like '94. Uh, they Microsoft hires Gertz Graffy to start building this in SQL Server in like '95. Um, the the there is a single code base. Sorry, there is a. There was a single code base for, for the Cascades optimizer, but my understanding from talking to Microsoft is like they forked it many, many times, and basically all the, the, the major database products that uh, Microsoft sells on-prem and in the cloud, like whatever, Synapse we'll cover later, um, Cosmos DB, they're all using Scope as another one. They're all using some derivation of the, of the original Cascades optimizer. Everything's written in C++. There's no DSL. Um, and then the to do transformations of the where clause expressions, all that is just doing if then else clauses and not uh, not rules running in, in the search engine. So as we said before, the what cas what their cascade is going to do is that they're going to have separate stages that are going to define here's the rules I actually want to consider at each stage. And the idea is that you start with the ones that you know you always want to run. You almost always want to run predicate pushdown. You, uh, maybe you always want, always want to run that like. You know, one equals two converts to false and things like that. Um, and then, so you always do these, 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 these transformations at the very beginning. And then at some point, you get to this point where you think, I want to do the cost-based search. And that you can, you can tweak and specify, here's the priority for some of these transformations based on what I saw uh, in the earlier stages that I evaluated. So in the very, very beginning, you just do basic simplification and normalization. So this would be doing logical tree to logical tree transformations. So the subquery stuff we'll talk about in a second. They have their own rules to do that. Outer joins, inner joins, predicate push down, and then empty result pruning. Like, you know, select star from table where, where false. Right? You, you can throw those things out. Then you get to what they call pre-exploration. Uh, and this is doing not the actual cost-based search, but this is applying rules to populate the memo table with things you know you, you think you want to uh, look at as you go down. Um, 
right? Because the idea is, again, you don't want to just blindly search in the beginning. You can see the, the memo table. It's like, here's the things that are, that are going to be interesting and guide the search towards, towards those, right? So trivia plan shortcut, like select, select one, right? Or select star from table, limit zero, things like that. Projection normalization, how to identify the stats. Uh, oh, sorry, projection normalization, again, cleaning up what's, what's in the, the select output. They do an interesting thing where they identify at this point here that they don't have all the stats they would need to, to you know, in their cost model to give good estimates. They will actually stop the query, stop the query planning, go tell the, the system to go run analyze now, collect the data that it's actually missing. Right? You can imagine the very beginning, if you, if you bulk load a table, you need something. And then when that, that's available, then they, they can come back and start doing some initial uh, cardinal estimates and then join collapsing when, when possible. Then they get to the cost-based search, uh, and this can still be multi-stage, where they're going to have the sort of the first group of transformations that they're allowed to consider, and then over time, as the number of transformations that, that they're that they're, they're, they've applied, because that's how they're keeping track of how long the search is going, but then expand the the set of transformations they're looking at to do more complicated things. So in the very beginning, it's for dealing with things like, like trivial plans, like uh, you know, lookups on a single table where there's a primary key index and stuff like that. And then if you still don't find the optimal plan, then you expand that out to a, a, a quick estimation on how to do a parallel, uh, parallel plan. Again, now you, can, you, you may be looking at you know, joining, or joining multiple tables. It's more than going looking up you know, a single tuple. And then if there's still more time in the clock as you go along, then you can, you can open up to do a, 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 a larger search for the full plan. And then in the last eight, Step and again, this is still within the Cascade Optimizer rules for all the different database engines or systems that they're that they're trying to run and support through Cascades. Uh, they would then have engine-specific uh, transformations that they can apply. So, for example, I think for Synapse is like the distributed data warehouse uh, based on SQL Server. We'll cover it at the end of the semester. Like you want to do distributed joins or uh, you know or broadcast joins and so forth. Like all those things get applied separately in, in this last stage here. Because that's sort of building upon the plan you built up so far. Yes. So for this uh, cost-based search initialization in the pre-exploration phase, like uh, I'm not completely sure I understand how you're going to decide how to populate. I, I assume this is the memo table you populate to help guide your search. Like how, how do you even you know like do, is it based on your analysis of the query or? His question is how do you pre-populate the memo table to see the search ahead of time? So like it would be it would be populating the memo table and also populating like the groups you you sort of generated. Right, say for, you know for this multi-expression on this this uh, uh, say joining three tables, if I know something in these early stages about like I always want to have this be the outer table and the inner table, so I'll see that 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 transformation ahead of time, and then if I have the estimate at this point, uh, you know getting past this step here, then I could I could put that cost in the memo table right away. So as I said before, the, uh, the timeouts are always going to be based on the number of transformations, not the wall clock time. And then what's, what's nice about this, as they bring up, is that, as I said, no matter what hardware you're running on, you could, you could, still, uh, you could always generate the same query plan given the same the database. And then if the system gets overloaded, because again, in this environment, it's not a, um, you know, in traditional SQL Server, it's like you know a single system where like the optimizer runs on the same box and the same hardware as you know the execution engine. So if the system gets overloaded, then the the time it takes to actually optimize the query is going to take longer because the threads are burning burning up, running queries or doing whatever. And so if you base it on wall clock, if I run the query today and it's and it's the system's not overloaded, I run the same query tomorrow. I may get a different plan if it's overloaded if I'm looking at wall clock time because just everything was so much slower. So this guarantees that you know no matter what I always see the I always get the, the best plan or the, the same plan. And then as we said before, you want to pre-populate the memo table with, with use, useful join orderings. Again, this is just your rules rules to make sure that things land. Uh, sorry, that that you you seeding the search in a way that you find the best uh, the best join earlier. And as this is very similar to the Oracle one. The order that they appear in the, in the SQL query is the order that you know that'll get seeded into the memo table, which sometimes makes sense, which Oracle did for a long time. All right, CalSite and Oracle, I don't want to talk too much about, but just I think everyone here is, is aware of them, right? These are separate. Um, these are 
standalone uh, query optimized optimizer as a service. Um, Calcite is way more is used way more than than Orca. Uh, it's written in Java, so that limits uh, how many people actually want to use this. Um, but the it's Calcite is an interesting piece because they I think they have their own they have connectors to be able to run queries and things like that. Like it's it's more than just a query optimizer, but most people either either for the SQL parser and and, and then the query optimizer. But you basically have to define. Uh, it comes with a bunch of existing rules, but if you want to then extend it to whatever system you want to support, you can then define through their Java code, here's the rules I, I want to transform things, here's how to do cost model estimates and so forth. Right? So this originally came out of a European system called LucidDB. Uh, this went under, um, and then they, I think it was a startup, and then they, they took the pieces out of this, and then that became Calcite. And, it, and again, it's used for a lot of systems. Greenplum is the equivalent to Calcite, but maybe the less uh, it's less uh, pluggable uh, focus. So like with Calcite, you can say you can have like here's my Snowflake dialect, here's my Postgres dialect. It supports a bunch of different dialects going in, and a bunch of, I think a bunch of different dialects going out. Where Orca is is more focused on just doing pure query optimization. So this is originally written at. I keep track of I lose track of who bought what. Uh, Greenplum got bought by EMC. EMC got bought by. Dell uh, or VMware, and then VMware, and then no, nah, no, nah. okay. EMC Greenplum got by EMC, and then VMware bought another company called Pivotal, and so EMC had a database products, and then VMware had database products, and they didn't know what to do with them, so they merged the two, they 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 spun out those two divisions of these two companies, and then they formed Pivotal, and then Pivotal eventually got bought back by by VMware. Um, Jignesh was out there for a while because his, his startup got bought by them. Anyway, so they were supporting Greenplum, which is, still exists today and is, is widely used. It's a fork of, uh, of Postgres, make like distributed uh, and you know, run, run OLAP queries. And then they had this thing called Hawk, which is their version of Hive, which is SQL on top of, of Hadoop. But then rather building a separate query optimizer for, for Hawk and a separate query optimizer for Greenplum, they decided let's build a single optimizer as a service and have it support both Hawk and Greenplum and whatever system you want to you want to hook up to it. Hawk is still around, but nobody actually uses it. Greenplum is still around, and so that's the, pri the, the, the primary user of Orca. But it's like Calcite, where again, you have this API you have to implement. Here's, here's what my catalog looks like. Here's what my logical plans and, and physical plans look like. Here's the rules I want you to support. Um, and they, they, you, know, you plug all that in, and, and you can use it. We looked at this phew, almost 10 years ago to use it in the system we were building. At the time, they had like zero documentation. It was just like, you send a bunch of XML files. Uh, and it would spit things out, and we decided not, not to pursue it. Um, but it's still, it's actively maintained today, but again, I don't think it's used any, anywhere outside of Greenplum. Calcite's more, more common. So there's a paper that they wrote uh, on Orca, and they talk about a couple interesting things I think, that are relevant for some of the discussions we've had. Maybe the, this is less of an issue if you're running, if you're not running, on, less of an issue if you're running on the cloud because you control the machines, you control everything, you can see everything. Um, but at the time for on-prem, this was, this was tricky. So, if someone's running your software on the, you know, on, on, on their, their hardware, if your optimizer crashes or produces a bad query plan, how do you actually then try to debug that and improve things, right? So if someone sends a support ticket and say, "Hey, my query went slow," you know, you don't have the, you, they can give you the SQL query, but if you don't have the right environment, if you don't have the right data, and you don't what you don't know what choices the optimizer made when it was doing the search, it's hard to debug this. So they had the ability to have the optimizer spit out a complete state of, of its search. For a given query, and then send that back to the home base for the developers to then almost like walk through exactly here's all the decisions that the optimizer made to when it generated the query plan. They can use that to figure out you know why it made certain choices over another. Again, if, if you're running in the cloud, you control everything. You you you, you, know, you, you can figure things out. And you don't have to do this. But another interesting thing that they do is make sure that the the cost model estimates are are accurate. They would do this thing where they would run a take a SQL query, run it through the optimizer, and they would keep track of the best plan and the second best plan, or the, you know maybe the top ten best plans, and they would and then in the background they would run all of them, and then see that the relative ordering of what the OS model thought was the best plans actually matches up with reality when you actually run the queries, and they would use that to then to tweak things and improve things. Yes. So that's like the MongoDB thing, right? Yes, but for like, uh, but Mongo didn't have like. How does this? MongoDB doesn't have a didn't have a cost model. It literally just like here they are, psh, run them, and then whatever they come back, right? This is trying to see whether your cost model 
is predicting the right you know, f physical cause. And they adjust it if it's and they adjust it if it's off. All right. So yes, at a high level, it's the same as Mongo, but Mongo is not trying to verify whether the cost model estimates are correct. They're just, they're just running it. Again, I, I should go double check that this is still what Mongo does today. I guess you'll find out. <laughs> it, it looks like that they might be trying to do stuff with actual cost models. Now. Okay. Did it, I mean, when I again, when, when I talked to them it's before the pandemic, they didn't even have like a they didn't have like any logical physical operators. It was just like here's the JSON stuff. Anyway. Um, all right, Cochrane GP rewrote or wrote from scratch their uh, query optimizer. Just like everyone else, they started with something that was based on heuristics, and then they wrote one that based on cascades. Um, everything's written in Go, and they, uh, they're more pure to the, the cascades model than, than maybe Microsoft was, because they would have a DSL that, that specified here's the rules and, then, and, and the transformations. And in some cases where you can't do the transformation entirely through their DSL, you could escape into uh, Go code. So here's basically what their, what their rules sort of look like, right? So you have like the, the matching that you want at this DSL, and then other things you may want to apply. And then this then gets transpiled into Go that they then run into the system. All right, Man, we're out of time again. Um, let me run, rush through randomized really quick, because again, this exists. Uh, Postgres does this. So Rather than doing top down or bottom up, what do you do if you just did a random walk? So you got to start with some some query plan, and that one you you, you, know, you can just do a straight conversion of a uh, of the AST from a logical plan into to a physical plan, and just permute that. But the idea is that you you look at a bunch of different possible uh, query plans, pick whatever one has the best cost, keep track of that, throw away the ones that are that are, that are the lowest cost. Do some kind of randomization or permutation on it to then change things, and then do another round and check all over again. So you're sort of randomly walking to try to see whether you stumble upon the, the best query plan. So the, there's an early paper in 1987 that does this with simulated annealing. Again, the idea is that you, you just swapping operators, in, like you know, the join ordering of two tables randomly. Uh, if the plan makes it worse, then you flip, it back, flip away to coin and, and see whether uh, you should just keep pursuing that, that down that path, otherwise you flip it back. Now there's a bunch of rules you gotta write to make sure that you don't do things like if it's a, if a left outer join where you have to care about one being joined before the other, you don't, you know, you don't put things in the wrong order. So you have to check to see whether you're, you're the, the, the random change is actually still a correct plan, but then if, if it doesn't get violated, then you can flip things around, right? Nobody does this. Uh, what, people, what Postgres does do is uses a genetic algorithm. I think this was in introduced in the mid-2000s. Um, so they're going to use a genetic algorithm where they're going to have these different generations of the different query plans. Again, you pick which one is the best, uh, throw away the ones that are worse, and then permute the best ones to try to, you know, sort of try to find the traits or the genes of the query plans that make it a good query plan, and then hope that you sort of stumble upon the best one. Right? So Postgres does this, but you only get it when you have, you give it a query that has more than 12 tables that you're trying to join in a single query. Uh, there's a flag you can specify what that cutoff is, but by default, you don't get this unless it's a 13-way you know, join or higher. So it looks like this. Say we get some random query. We have a bunch of different uh, random combinations of join orders and, and, and join algorithms. You pick, you, first you cost all of them. Uh, keep track of the one with the lowest cost up in the corner. We just keep track of the best one I've ever seen. Throw away, throw away the one that has the, the, the worst cost. Uh, and then permute, permute some, some, you know, some portion of the query plans of the ones you keep around. And then the next generation, you, you, you populate those. Do the same thing. Check which one has the lowest cost. This one does, so that's not near our best cost. Throw away, one, throw away the, the weakest one, right, the weakest of this generation, permute them, and then and so forth. Right? Yes? Are these realized costs or estimated costs? These are estimated costs. Why would they be realized? Well, I, I didn't know if like, they would like, pick these random queries and then run each random one and then like, pick no, this is like again. This is all within the query optimizer. Only like only Mongo does that. Like runs everyone. Like this is like using the cost model. That's what we'll talk about next week. Yes. So uh, in this case, it's how does it come up with the first generation? So question is how do you come up with the first generation? It's random. Even the first generation. Okay. Yeah. So the first generation is random, and after that, it's specifically picking things that it could. Yes. Change. Right. All right. So I, I know I have to join R, R S and T. So let me do different join orders. 
different physical operators, right. and then just, and then just so try it out. So I know in the case of Postgres, like they make sure that the 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 random permutation is, is deterministic because you don't want to be you know, if you throw the same query at it again, yeah. you want to end up and you're using running this thing, you want to end up with the same permutation, right? Um, yes. This seems like a good idea. Seems like a good idea. Uh, why? Is it not used? It's a good idea because if you have thirteen joints, like thirty, like that's a lot of them. So going from a randomized rather than you know approaching it from like. Like almost exhaustive of like a tree top down view or a bottom up one is just too slow and you're unlikely to get the right joint for every single one of them and you'll run out of time. So if you go from a randomized, you have a higher chance. Is that not true? Am I just pitfalling here? I don't really know. Yeah, uh, if, from, from a first intuition, it seems like th this should work, right? There's an engineering cost to making sure that you don't permute things incorrectly, right? So then now you're maintaining code to do that. And that's, again, that's going to be much if then else rules. Uh, for very, very large tables, uh, for a large number of tables, you know, the, a greedy search probably would, would be better. Again, think of like joining 30 tables, 40 tables. Right. Yeah. Doing randomized seems so much better for that. Uh, because you, do, you start from a random, because there's so many possibilities. So, <laughs> yeah. So this is a talk from, from, from the guy that actually works on this in the query optimizer and from Postgres a few years ago. Um, he, he basically said that the one in Postgres at least is broken. Uh, it's not truly randomized as much as it should be. Or they're not, I don't think they're, they're not like incorporating the traits that, that, are, that are best from one generation to the next. Um, I think that, I don't want to say it's a hack, but I think that the, and we, we just don't have time to cover the hyper one. The hyper one is the better way to do this if you, they're, they have basically an adaptive algorithm that can figure out like if above a certain number joins, it's a, it's a, like a greedy based search is actually better. We've covered this in the, in the reading group. We can cover it again. I'll, cover, I'll, I'll mention that next class. I just don't have slides for it. So again, no, nobody actually does this. All right, with 20 minutes to go, are there any questions before we switch over to, to the, the paper reading? Yes? I have a question about the randomization. Do they randomly, like, because like, SQL queries are highly structured, do they randomly like make the choices from the, like, the top down to generate like just a random query? And do they do it over the logical plan first and then insert the physical components or like? This question is like, how, how are you populating this? Yeah. So you have a logical plan mm -hmm. um, and then you, you, you can you could just use <laughs> the order in the tables they appear in the SQL query. That's the order, that's your initial ordering. And then like you're just flipping things around. But, but a logical plan already has like structure. So getting through a yes. logical plan is like not Right. So you you statement is like the logical plan has some structure. Yes, and again, depending on what, if it's a if it's an inner join, those things are commutative. You can swap them anywhere. But like if it's an outer join or one of these correlated subqueries, like that you got to be careful about. So you got to make sure you don't violate that. But like if it's if things are commutative, then you can take you know the logical plan and say join you know join R join S join T. Like you'll have that tree structure and you just commute that. No, in the very beginning, it, it, it is like, you have to generate this, this first generation. Right, but like once you, like, let's say, like, the root, and then like, all these changes are like just one change. Uh, so what do you mean? All, the, like, all, all these changes are like, you're just changing one part of the, the tree. So yeah, you're changing, changing the entire thing every single time. Correct, yes. Because yeah. the idea is that, like, the, like in this case here, I, I somehow figured out that the, this hash join on, on the hash join where S followed by R, or you know, S is the outer, R is the inner. You don't know whether that's the why this you know made this one the best. So you want to carry that over to the next one, uh, in this case up here, so that like and then you permute some, maybe other things about it, so that if it truly is the reason why your costs are lower, then that trait will get carried over over time. Okay. So let's see how far we can get through. Um, Subqueries, okay. Um, okay. There should be no surprise to anyone. Subqueries are important in SQL. Uh, it's wild. You can put them anywhere in, in your SQL query. Um, 
I, I, I wasn't able to, I tried it last night, I wasn't able to get it into a Nessa query into my order by clause. Well, no, Postgres will let you put in the order by clause, but I don't think it actually does anything. Right? I was trying to like have it return a string that's the name of the table I want to look up. Um, and it runs it, but I think it's just getting converted into to true. So you can do you can put an order by clause in, in the select statement. Or sorry, in the order by you can put a select statement inside the order by clause in some cases, but I, I don't think it actually works. Right? And the way to think about, of a nested query or subquery is that it's basically like a function that like has some outer query I'm gonna evoke into it and maybe pass in some information or not about what the outer query is, the two I'm looking at in the outer query. Uh, and then I'm going to produce, produce some, some, some result that I can then use for, uh, for, for my other query. And this is important because this allows people to write more expressive things in a single SQL query rather than have to run multiple queries, stage it in temp tables or whatever, and then, uh, and then, and then put, you know, put it all together at the end. So there's this key distinction that's going to matter a lot between uncorrelated and correlated subqueries. And the TLDR is that uncorrelated ones are easy. Most data systems will be able to handle those. It's the correlated ones that are going to cause problems. The uncorrelated ones basically means that the, the, whatever my subquery is doesn't depend on anything on the outer query. Meaning I'm not using any information, any attributes, any tuple data from the outer query to run that inner query. So I only need to logically execute this inner query once. Whether or not the data system is smart enough to do that depends on the implementation. Um, but the ones you know, we can, we'll look at, uh, we can talk about, uh, we'll handle this. Right, so in this example here, I want to get the, all the students that have the, or get, find me the, student, the name of the student that has the, the highest grade in, in some class or, or across all the students. So this inner query on the, on the select max score from students doesn't rely on anything from the outer, outer uh, query on students. So I can just run this once, materialize the result, and, and, and be able to you know, substitute that in for every tuple I'm looking at on the outer query. Again. I think for most systems, they should be able to handle all, all, all cases for this. Um, actually, that's not true. There are some cases where the, uh, they, can't, they can't handle uncorrelated subqueries. The basic idea what you're trying to do is basically come, you want to move this up and get this to be a join up above. Yes? That was a typo on the slide, right? Uh, which one? Yeah, it does not. Thank you. Yes. I will fix. All right. Again, correlated, correlated subqueries are the ones we care about. Again, this is where the inner query, the, the subquery, is going to reference something in, in the outer query here. So now if we do modify a query to say, give me all the students uh, that have the highest grade in their, their major across all the, all the students in the same major, then the, the basic idea is that for this, I'm going to have a for loop that's going to be the going over every single tuple in, my, in the outer query. And then for each of those tuples, I need to do a, a complete sequential scan or scan on the, on, the, on the inner table, the inner subquery's results, right? So let's say if I start my outer, outer query, the first one I look at is with the, the, the first tuple, which is a, and he's major computer science. So then now when I invoke the inner query, I'm going to scan through and then now do that join where I take the outer query's major, match it against the inner query's major, and then, and then get the max score. So I'm going to run this entirely and produce a max score of 90. And I'm going to and then populate this as my output result here. Next, quick, for the next one, again, for RISA, also on comp sign, do the same thing, start from the beginning, scan it again, get max score of 90. That doesn't match what the RISA score is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, RISA score, so therefore uh, that does not produce the output. For ODB, he's the only one majoring streets. So again, start at the beginning, scan through, it matches, produce my output like that. Right? So what I just showed here is like the worst thing you could possibly do because for every single tuple in the, in the outer, outer table, I'm rerunning that, that join query over again for, for, uh, in the inner table. Yes? Is this, is this going to go um, happening in uh, the where clause or is it going to be happening in the outer? Yeah, his question is like, can you have this inner query in a where clause? It, it can happen anywhere. Right? I can have it as the from clause. I could have it the projection output. I was saying, still to variable. Correct. Yes. Okay. I can put like again. You can have it in limits. You can have it in. Uh, you can have nested queries in limits. Actually, I don't. Know if, I don't know if you can reference the outer query. I don't know if you, you can have correlated subqueries in limit clauses. I think having can do it like anywhere. You can't have a uh, correlated one in from either, right? So in from, how could it be? Correlated? Lateral join. Okay. Right. It's basically the same thing. 
All right, so the paper you guys read, uh, we'll, we'll get to see how they do in a second. The goal is, again, basically we want to lift up this, this inner query to be at the same level of the outer query, because then we can then convert it into a join, and we know how to run those efficiently. We know how to optimize those, right? And then we know how to, given what we talked about the last two classes, we know how to pick the, right, the best join order for these things as well. So for this query here, ideally we want to move the, uh, we want to move the inner query to be now be in, in the join clause and the from clause against the, the outer query here. But now we've got to be mindful that, yes, we need the score of, uh, of, of the students. Um, that, should, that should not be S2, get rid of that, sorry. Uh, but now we want to group by major, because that's how we're going to uh, do our join down here, because we want to see is for my, what's the best score for my outer tuple uh, for a given major, and is it, is it my score? Right? So for this example, yeah, we can look at this and say, OK, we could write something reasonably uh, easily to, to do this kind of manipulation. And as I was saying, since these nest queries can appear anywhere, and in this case here, it's, it's a straight equality predicate, but you can imagine like uh, equals any exists, less than, greater than, anti joins, semi joins. Like you can have all different kinds of combinations, and it's very difficult to, 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 to write the rules to capture everything. But this is what basic, basically people have been doing for the last 30 years. Yes, quick question. Uh, so in the paper, when they specify join, they, like, they don't actually use a join keyword. Is that just a different syntax? The question is, in the paper, they don't, they don't specify join. They're equivalent. Modern SQL standard says you're supposed to use join. But like, yeah, you could just have this be comma. your comma, and then it's just a where clause. From, from the, that's that normalization step that I talked about in, um, in, in like SQL Server, like they'll, they want, they'll figure out what's in the where clause and move, you know, which, what's in the where clause that should be part of the join and move that to be part of the join clause. But they're, they're, they're equivalent. All right, so again, for the last, I think the first paper on nested queries is like 83, 84. Uh, I think the SQL standard ended at, I think it's SQL 99. Um, but since then, people have been, again, just writing a bunch of rules to handle all possible these different combinations that they're aware of. Right, so this is from the SQL Server paper from 2001 that roughly defines the rules that they apply. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is how they they decide what to uh, when when they can decorrelate uh, nested queries. In SQL Server, you look at the documentation. They basically have well, uh, up to 22 rules. It's a bunch of this. Like if it does this and this and this and this, right? This is, defines how they they're going to do uh, uh, you know unnesting. But again, all of these are going to be based on heuristics and rules. Uh, so on the plus side is these are somewhat, easily to, to, somewhat easy to write if you know the pattern that you're looking for uh, and because you can have complete control of like when things get moved and how, how they get moved. But as I'm saying, like, it, to handle all possible edge cases that you've got to deal with, all possible where clauses and any kind of combinations of, of, of these nested queries, lateral joins is, is, is another thing that's complicated. Uh, then writing these rules by hand is just simply uh, too, too ineffective. So this is where the Germans show up uh, in this paper in 2015. So there's actually two papers on the reading list. This is the first one. There's a follow-up one in 2017 that covers more about how, uh, how they handle joints or other things. But I just wanted to focus on this one because it's, it's an easy read-ish uh, on how to do the, these correlated subqueries. But they, they actually provide, the, as far as I know, the first general purpose method to be able to take all uh, correlated subqueries and rewrite them into uh, to, to, re to regular queries, you know, with, without the nesting. Um, and the goal is basically you want to convert all of these, these, these subqueries into joins, regular, like inner joins, outer joins, whatever, whatever, whatever it's supposed to be, because, again, we know how to optimize those. And the best case scenario, we can go from some, doing something really stupid, like running the, that nested query for every single tuple in the outer, outer query, which, you know, could be n squared cost in a nested loop join, we can now convert this into, you know, like an ON hash join lookup. So let me quickly go through one example. Um, again, we can cover more of the hyper stuff uh, next class. So here's that same query that we had before. We want to find all the students and their major if they have the, um, if they have the highest grade for their major. So the key idea that they're going to, they're going to have in this paper is that they're going to introduce this, this logical concept or logical operator called a dependent join. And it's basically a cross-product join or cross-join, except that it's a, it's a 
there's a demarcation or it's a marker to say this thing is specifically being used because it's I'm doing a uh, a correlated subquery. And the whole goal of what they're, the, the process thing they're going to do is try to get rid of that dependent join, convert it regular to, to regular joins, and then you know, optimize it like, like it normally would. So in this case here, just the outer query itself is a projection with a filter and a scan. But inside this filter clause, right, we have this, uh, we have, we have this, this, you know, the, the subquery inside of this. So if we take this and expand this, we can convert it into a dependent join because now we have on the the the, the right hand side is the uh, sorry the left hand side maybe it's right uh, the left hand side is the the lookup on on the outer table and then now on the other side on the right hand side this is actually the inner query and it's going to be referencing uh, in in its filter or for its where clause predicate it's going to be referencing the thing on the other side right because that that's what makes it correlated. So as I said, this dependent join isn't actually a new physical operator. It's not something we actually implement in the system. It's just an extension to relational algebra uh, in our query plans that allows us to reason about we know we're doing certain transformations in our query optimizer because we, it's a correlated subquery. Again, so you could just convert this to like a cross join and add a little flag and say, hey, by the way, I'm using this for you know, keep track of dependencies. But to keep it clean, they, they, they define it as a separate operator. right? So again, all you're doing is that for every single tuple in the, in the left-hand side, you're going to rerun whatever it is on, on the right-hand side and populate, populate the output and so forth. Right? So again, it's, it's just like a cross product. So what they're going to want to try to do now is try to push down the dependent join to the right-hand side of the query plan where we have our, our inner query. And you eventually want to try to get it to the bottom and then convert it into a, a regular join. And then how you actually do this is going to depend on the semantics of the query and uh, you know, of the inner query to determine how you actually do these, these transformations. So in this case here, I have, again, the scan on the left-hand side and the, the, the inner query on the right-hand side. So I can move the dependent join down one, and then now just do a, a join, uh, a regular join on, on the, outer, you know, the outer query, and then whatever's coming up to me from, from the right-hand side here. So for this particular query to make this work, I have to introduce an, an additional scan that's, that's basically going to do duplicate elimination. Think of like uh, you know, a select clause where the, uh, all the, the, the projection output list is also my group I. So this guarantees that I'm always going to have a distinct uh, set, of, set of attributes or set of values coming out for, for all the attributes for a given tuple. Right? So now with this, 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 uh, with this uh, uh, eliminating all the duplicates on this side, when I do now a dependent join on this side, then this guarantees that uh, I'm only spitting up now the, the, the output that I need to do the join without duplicates as if I was running the, the right-hand side query once per tuple on the, uh, on the outer table. Because again, I, what am I doing? I'm doing a max on the student score, uh, looking up by major. So all I really want is for every major, what's the max score? So to avoid duplicates of like, okay, because there's, you know, there's two people in computer science, and I don't want to have two entries, one, you know, with the same values of computer science and then score. The duplicate elimination scan, when I do my join, will, will remove all that for me. Again, this is just a logical operator. This is keeping track of what the dependencies are uh, from the right hand side to the left hand side as I'm going down. So, I want to keep pushing down the dependent join. So at the next stage, right? I can get rid of the, going back here, I, I, can, I, can, I want to get it below the aggregation. So I'm going to move my, my duplicate elimination scan down with me, but then put the aggregation above me. Right? And again, at this point, nothing has changed. You think sort of the, what the, the output's going to be. Like everything's still the same because what am I doing here? I'm getting all this, the unique students uh, by, by score and major, and then I want to join it with the. Um, with the, the, the scan on the, on the student's table here. So this is going to produce, you know, for every single student, or every single major, here's the highest score. And then when I feed that out of my dependent join, thinking that just, just as a cross product, when I now do my group by here on the major, I'm going to get, for one major, I'm going to get one, the max score for it. Yes? I think the interesting thing is how did we come up with the, the fact that it's supposed to be group by? Because in the previous slide, the, the group by was not there. It was just max score, right? Yeah, so you have to identify to, because you have logic to say, okay, I know that I, I want to get the, 
I only want to get the, the, a single score per major, right? So the equivalent thing you would do here by, by putting the aggregation above, well, I need to make sure that I only get one student per major or one score per, per major, and then th you add the group by to make that happen. Yeah, so there's logic we have to, to, to be able to reason about what the, what the inner query actually wants when you do the join up above to make sure you don't have duplicates. Uh, you know, f is there a way to standardize that? Or could that seem like a it, complicated bit? That it's, it, his question is, is there a way to standardize that? Uh, it's, in the paper. it's in the original paper, and then it, and it, 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 it varies based on what the where clause is, right? Mm -hmm. This is like something equals something. If it's less than or greater than, mm -hmm. nulls complicates things too, right? Yeah. Th this makes everything harder. Uh, we're well over time, so if you have to go, please go. We can, we can, we can do what we did last time. We can, we can pick up on this uh, last class, or, and, and the beginning of next class. All right, so we push the aggregation above. Again, we want to go further. We, we want to get this dependent join now below this filter. Well, that's easy to do, right? Because there isn't actually any changes to, to, we need to make because it, whether or not we put the filter before or after the join, that's the same thing if it was a regular query, right? Like you can do a join stupidly without a where clause and it's just a Cartesian product. And then above that, then you do the filter. Same thing here, right? So in this case here, again, it's just a Cartesian product. For every unique student or stu every unique major, I'm going to join against uh, every unique major and a score. I'm going to join against all the students table. It's going to produce all the output I want, you know, all possible combinations. And then this is going to filter out that I only get where the student from this side is equals the major of, of the student or the major on that side. All right. So now at this point here, my dependent join is as far as it can go. I can't go below these guys because it doesn't make any sense because these are the leaf nodes I'm scanning the tables, right? So now I want to actually do further optimizations to actually put it into a, a physical form, or sorry, put it into a form that I know how to optimize like any other query. So again, these are all still at the logical level. We're not doing any, none of these are physical operators, right? So I can convert this dependent join into what it really is, which is just a cross join or Cartesian product, right? So there's no where clause. It's just, just you know, everything co combined with everything on the other side. Um, but then now I have, as I was saying before, I have a filter above a join that's just an inner join. So now I can collapse these two to a single join operator and just move these guys up, right? I can go e either, even further and recognize that, well, all, you know, this is basically just for every single major, uh, for every single student get their major. That's all this is doing here, right? Because my group by is gonna handle the, the removing, removing the duplications. So I can, then, uh, I can then convert this now into just a scan on, on the table S by itself. But now to make sure that I, I have to rewrite my, my join that I had up here, because I was referencing that, that deduplication scan on the major, I need to get rid of that. So I can now also have a filter above that too. So I can just combine that now into a single join where it's the major on this side, join the major on that side, and the score on this side equals the max score that I produce as my output here. And because I have the group I and the major clause, I'm guaranteeing that for every single major, I have, I have one score. So this, this is the easy case, right? And again, there's some details that I'm, that I'm glossing over. For example, he was asking, how do I know that I need to push up the group I? Again, it depends on the examination of the where clause in the, in the expression trees. So this can then be extended for all possible combinations of, of, of correlated queries. Um, and you can, you can convert everything into a, to joins. All right, we're well over time. As I was saying, only Hyper, Umbra, and DuckDB can do this fully. Databricks can do some of it. I don't know about other systems. I haven't seen whether they, they, they make these games as well. Um, so like, this is, like, if you're gonna build a new system today, this is, this is the way to do it. And this paper lays out exactly how to do it. Um, Again, we, we'll cover the other, some more cases in the next class. Uh, we'll cover also then how they're handling, handling join, uh, picking join orders. But the other big thing we already alluded to today is like, OK, all the things I've talked about is like, hey, you have a cost. That's going to tell you whether one plan is better than another. What if your cost, cost estimates are wrong? Or you just don't know because you haven't even looked at the data before. In a, in a lake house environment, some new files showed up in S3. You don't know what's in them. What do you do? So that, that's what we'll cover on next class. Right, how to do adaptive query optimization. So, and the TLDR is going to be: I got to generate something. I got to generate some query plan because I, I got to run something. But I, again, I can put in hooks that keep track of whether my estimates are right or wrong. 
and we'll see how to get, get feedback from uh, when we scan the table, feed that back into our cross models and see what, whether that helped or not. Okay? All right, guys, enjoy the weekend. See ya. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got sore cans. Stack some six packs on the table. And I'm able to see saying eyes on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes are said, the pain eyes red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of snake eye.